Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over chemical reactions and word equations, so make sure that you're following along in your notes and that you're filling in everything as you see. So, uh, what is a chemical reaction? Well, we defined chemical change uh, in Unit 2, I believe, and a chemical reaction is basically a chemical change. It is the process of rearranging elements to form different substances. And so, we already went over the signs of chemical reactions, but how many of these can you remember? We had these six. So we have color changes, light and radiation being released, temperature changes, bubbling or foaming, new substances forming, and odors. Remember, these do not necessarily mean that a chemical change has occurred, but they can point you in that direction. So if you have one or more of these, it could be the sign that a chemical reaction has occurred. All right, so. How do we represent chemical reactions? Well, we use chemical equations, which we're familiar with to some degree. And remember, also from Unit 2, reactants are the substances that enter a chemical reaction, so they are written on the left side. And products are substances that are made in a chemical reaction, so they're always on the right. So you can think of this as our sort of generic formula for writing chemical reactions. You'll have reactant 1 plus reactant 2 yields product 1 plus product 2. And you can have as many reactants or products as you need. So you can have one reactant and multiple products, or you can have many reactants and only one product. So it's important to recognize the different symbols that are used in chemical equations. And so remember, anytime you see an arrow, that can be read as the word yields or forms. And the purpose of an arrow in a chemical reaction or chemical equation is to separate the reactants from the products. So anytime you see an arrow, that should be your, um, your clue that your reactants are over here and your products are on the opposite side. Next up, we have the plus sign, which can basically be read as an and. So if you see a plus, uh, you can read that verbally as just an and. You don't say plus, you say and. Uh, what's the purpose? It separates two or more reactants and or products. So that's why we have reactant 1 and then a plus sign and then reactant 2. So if we were reading that, it would be reactant 1 and reactant 2. The next three are pretty self-explanatory, but they are our state symbols that we're very familiar with. So if you see a parentheses S like this, that means that that substance is a solid, and it identifies a solid state of matter. So for example, if you have AL, and then you have a S in parentheses, that means you have solid aluminum. Next up, if you see a parentheses and an L, that represents a liquid. And so to distinguish between those, I'll use the same thing. Let's say we have liquid aluminum. So if you saw this, that would be that you had liquid aluminum, not solid, but as a liquid instead. And then, of course, we have G, which means gas, and that identifies a gaseous state of matter. So since aluminum doesn't really form a gaseous substance, I'll just pick something else. Uh, we'll do helium. So helium with a G after it, that means that I have helium gas. Now last but not least, this is the uh, state symbol that people often get confused about. Uh, it's a parentheses AQ, and it means aqueous. Okay, uh, so what does that mean? That means it's a solution of water and another substance. So you can think of it, this is kind of where we get the word, you know, aqua, which means H2O. Uh, it's a substance dissolved in water. So, for example, one of the best examples that you could ever really think about here is, let's say I have salt, N-A-C-L, solid, okay? That means I have table salt, like something I could find on my kitchen table. But if I say I have N-A-C-L and then I have an A-Q, which means aqueous N-A-C-L, that means I have salt water. I have a solution of salt and water mixed together. And so the reason why aqueous is used, uh, and is really actually used a lot, is because a lot of times we don't just use a pure solid, we actually dissolve it in water and then we use it in that form. And so that's what we refer to as an aqueous state of matter. 
So how can we represent chemical equations? Well, we can do that using many different things. We could use words, we can use symbols, and we can use pictures. And we're going to use all three throughout the entire year, okay? So the first one up we're going to use are these symbols, okay? And so this is where knowing your state symbols and knowing what your plus means and what your, you know, arrow means comes really in handy, okay? And so that's symbolically H2 plus O2 yielding H2O. Okay? Now, in a picture form, this is what H2 looks like, this is what O2 would look like, and this is what H2O would look like. So symbolically, I have this up here. In a picture form, I have this. If you're wondering why there are two hydrogens and then there are like two waters, it's because uh, they're doing a picture as a balanced equation, which we won't be talking about until, you know, a couple of days from now. So anyway, pictures, though, can be used to represent things, and sometimes that's really useful to us. So especially if, you know, we kind of use different colors here, then we can kind of see what's going on. So for example, in my actual picture now, uh, I can tell that I have my hydrogen, and it is breaking apart, and it is attaching itself to an oxygen. So that gives me actually an idea of what's going on in my chemical reaction. Now, finally, the last thing I can use are sort of words, and that's why I have to know how to translate between symbols and words, okay? So, for example, how would I read this symbolic equation? I would say hydrogen gas, so I got... I took care of this part of my equation, and that's because we have a plus. Oxygen gas takes care of this, yields, that is my arrow, liquid water, and that's the last part right here. So being able to seamlessly switch from symbols to pictures to words is kind of what we're going for in this unit, all right? And also, this is why it is still important to know how to name compounds and write their formulas. Because you could be given words and have to translate that into a bunch of symbols. And if you don't remember how to write chemical formulas, if you see sodium chloride or, you know, like silver nitrate, you might not be able to write the correct symbol for that substance. So if you don't remember how to do that, please make sure you look back at ionic compounds and covalent compounds and how to name those. All right, so the final bit for today is now, how can we turn our word equations into symbols and going between those two seamlessly? So the one thing that I didn't get a chance to tell you guys yet and that I've been saving for a bit is um, some elements are diatomic. Remember, di means two, atomic is referring to atoms, and what that means are um, or sorry, what that means is there are a collection of elements on the periodic table that never travel alone, okay? And so here's our list, and I'm going to give you guys definitely some time to copy that down. Um, and it seems like a random list of different gases or elements, and how are you supposed to remember that? Well, these are her diatomic gases, and it's very important to remember them, because if I'm talking about nitrogen gas, you might think that just would be the element N, but no, it's N2, okay? N2 is nitrogen gases um, formula. O2 is oxygen gases formula. There's no such thing as just an O by itself in nature. It's always paired up with another oxygen. Uh, so how are we supposed to remember these? Well, luckily there are seven diatomic gases, or seven diatomic elements, I guess I should say, because some of them don't always form gases. Uh, but they're, they form a seven on the periodic table. So as you can see right here on my weird picture, uh, these are six of our seven elements that are diatomic. They're all right here. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And then over here, of course, <laughs> hydrogen being an exception to almost everything, uh, is an exception. It is the only one that is not found in that weird seven. So uh, this is really important because you will see in word equations oxygen gas or chlorine gas or hydrogen gas or fluorine gas. And so if you were just to write down the element by itself, that would technically be incorrect. You need to make sure that it's N2 or O2 or F2, etc. 
so this is where we're going to leave off. Uh, can we turn word equations into symbols? And so if you want to, you can attempt these on your own and just kind of try them out and see what goes wrong and what you do correctly. But here's the thing, we're really looking at how well you remember not just your elemental symbols, but how well you can write formulas for compounds still. Do you still remember how to write ionic compound formulas? Do you still know how to write molecular compound formulas or acids and stuff like that? Can you do these things? And how much of it would you still need to go back and review? And that's very important. So I'm going to start with number one. I have solid aluminum. So I'm going to break this apart into just what I need to write down. Solid aluminum. So that would be Al and then S, like this, and liquid bromine. And is a plus liquid bromine. So this is why you need to know your diatomic elements, because bromine is always diatomic. So I would need to put Br2. Forms, that means I have an arrow, solid aluminum bromide. All right, now here's again where you need to be able to write your ionic formulas for something. So aluminum bromide would be AlBr3, and it says it's solid, so I have to include S at the end here. All right? That would be the correct word equation for solid aluminum and liquid bromine form solid aluminum bromide. Let's move on to the next one. Solid iron. All right, so I have solid iron, Fe with an S because it's solid, and aqueous nitric acid. Can you remember how to write formulas for acids? If it's nitric acid, that means it must be one of my... Um, polyatomic ions, and so that would be aqueous nitric acid, forms iron 3 nitrate and hydrogen gas. So forms, that's my arrow, iron 3 nitrate, I'm going to run out of room, but iron 3 nitrate, can you write ionic formulas for things with transition metals still? All right, nitrate, that would be iron 3 nitrate, nitrate is a minus 1, iron was a plus 3, and hydrogen gas, so and, and then again, do you remember hydrogen is a diatomic element? Oh, and I forgot, because it doesn't say what state of matter iron 3 nitrate is in. I don't need to include a state symbol. You don't need to assume, you don't need to guess. If it doesn't tell you, don't include it, okay? Um, and so it'll, it'll point out what the state of matter is. You don't have to guess what the state of matter is. So if it does say something without a state of matter, just do not include it. Okay, don't guess, because you might guess incorrectly. All right, and then last but not least, solid sodium carbonate breaks apart to yield carbon dioxide gas and solid sodium oxide. All right, so let's break that apart. Solid sodium carbonate. So can you write your formula for sodium carbonate? That's Na2CO3. Carbonate is minus two, sodium is a plus one. It says it's solid. Breaks apart to yield. That's just a fancy, fancier version of an arrow. Okay? Carbon dioxide gas. That's CO2 gas. All right? And solid sodium oxide. So solid sodium oxide, again, making sure that you remember how to write your formulas. N2O is sodium oxide, and it is a solid. So I have to make sure that I include solid there. All right, and that's how you would turn symbols, sorry, that's how you would turn word equations into symbols. So if you have any particular questions, make sure that you ask, and um, if you need to review things about ionic uh, naming and about you know molecular compound naming, make sure you do so before tomorrow.